You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. The sea supports life, but it also takes it. It's dangerous. When a voyage goes terribly wrong, you need courage, ingenuity, sheer grit and sometimes just luck to survive. You're about to hear four remarkable stories of survival at sea, including the account of an Australian woman who spent 52 days in a lifeboat. We're starting with an heroic, though unlikely, battle what curator Shane Casey describes as a daring-do story. There were 56 survivors. We're looking at a badly damaged piece of steel pipe from a Dutch oil tanker called the Ondina. It's about one and a half metres high and is sitting upright in a display case. So why is it so special? It really shows something of the the horror, I think, of war and of the danger of being close to something like that. The amazing thing about this pipe is that it's riddled with shell holes. You can see where bullets and shrapnel have burst into the pipe and out the other side, leaving holes and jagged bits of metal. It was November 1942. The Ondina had left Fremantle on a voyage to pick up oil in the Persian Gulf. She was escorted by an Indian naval ship, the Bengal, with an Australian crew on board. Halfway across the Indian Ocean, the ships were spotted by two Japanese raiders. These raiders were basically converted merchant ships that the Japanese had turned into armed cruisers and they were hunting for any Allied ships that they could pick off. One of the Japanese raiders started firing at the Ondina and the Bengal, the Indian ship, And both the Bengal and the Ondina returned fire. Now, neither of our ships had uh, much in the way of armament. The Ondina only had one gun and the Bengal only had one gun. And the Ondina's gun only had 25 rounds of ammunition, so it was a very one-sided fight. Our guns were also quite small in comparison to the Japanese ones. The Bengal basically sent a message to the Ondina saying, get out of here as quickly as you can and, and run for cover. But the Ondina didn't do that. The Ondina turned around and went in to join the fight and to help the Bengal. The Bengal fired first and hit the first Japanese raider. And then, to the Bengal's shock and surprise and delight, the Ondina opened fire as well. And on its second shot, it hit the stern of one of the Japanese raiders and there was a massive explosion. And very quickly afterwards, the Japanese raider sank. But the other Japanese raider was still there. It turned its sights on the Ondina and the Bengal and began firing, hitting both ships. The Ondina's captain, Willem Horsman, was killed from a direct shot to the bridge. The Bengal was on fire and it it limped away, thinking that the Ondina was sinking, and it made for Diego Garcia. The Ondina was still in the area, and the Japanese torpedoed the Ondina. The Ondina was on fire. The crew abandoned ship, or those that survived, And while they were in the lifeboats, the Japanese came very close and started machine gunning the survivors in the boat before they then turned away and started trying to rescue the survivors from the first Japanese ship. And then they left the scene thinking that the Ondina was going to sink. And they left the the crew in these lifeboats to their, their own resources. Well, the Ondina wasn't sinking and the survivors managed to then rejoin the ship, climb on board. It took eight hours before the, all the fires were put out and it took about another week before the Ondina managed to limp back into Fremantle. So let me get this right. The, the survivors were in the lifeboats. They were fired upon by the Japanese. Presumably some of them died. Yes, that's right. A number of people died in the lifeboats from being machine gunned. But the survivors then realised the ship wasn't sinking, or at least hoped it wasn't, and went back on board and saved it. That's right. There they were in the middle of the Indian Ocean. The Bengal has disappeared off the horizon. Both Japanese ships were one sunk and one's now gone, and they had to do something. And uh, it was an amazing thing. These these were merchantmen and, and some naval, Royal Australian Naval personnel as well. 
but uh, I think it was that period when you just had to, you know, you had to survive and you had to rejoin the ship and spend eight hours putting the fires out. And then once that was done, the ship limped back into Fremantle, much to the surprise of the port authorities there who thought that the ship had been sunk. What was the reaction from the people in Fremantle when the Ondina limped back into port? Well, I don't know about the reaction in Fremantle specifically, but certainly during the Second World War, the story of the Ondina was lauded by the naval authorities as a really heroic event. I have at home, for example, a a war economy publication that my father bought during the war as a, as a child, and it had the epic story of the Ondina in it. So, you know, and that was 1944, so a year later, and this story is being basically pushed out around the world. As an example of the heroics and bravery and the amazing survival of the of the crew. Yes, and I think also the Merchant Navy has traditionally been given a lesser stance during the Second World War in terms of heroics than the navies. And even back then, it was very much a case that uh, it was seen as a really risky business and not so heroic possibly, but, gee, you know, those people uh, on board the, the cargo ships kept Britain and, and the colonies' lifelines going and took enormous risks, and, and so many of them died, and in horrendous circumstances and alone, you know, often torpedoed and, um, and, and in the water for, for you know, a month before they were rescued. So I think the authorities were very keen on showing that there, there were heroics and that noble deeds were being done all the time. So this story, as it was told during the Second World War, would have been a huge morale booster. Yes, yes, but I don't know that I would have wanted to have joined the Merchant Navy as a result of hearing these stories. It really is quite a, quite a harrowing um, episode. It was portrayed by the Allied governments as a truly noble and heroic thing. And the fact that the crew had been able to sink an enemy raider with basically one shot, and they'd also destroyed two of the raider's aircraft, which were mounted on the stern of the ship, was, was a great thing. And uh, they were very, very proud of, of their efforts. We've got a photograph actually in the collection of the crew of the Ondina in Fremantle, holding up a big banner saying one Japanese raider and two Japanese aircraft sunk. And, and they're very proud of this. Now to our second story about a merchant seaman called Arga Bergdahl. He was a 25-year-old Norwegian. And he served in the Second World War, travelling between Australia and the world. The ships he was on were cargo ships, usually taking supplies for the war effort. Curator Diane Rutherford is showing me Arga's service medals, which include a tiny horizontal badge inscribed with the words, Survived Once. And he was awarded that because he survived the sinking of his tanker, the merchant vessel Scotia. Depending on how many times you were sunk and survived an enemy attack, you could receive um, survived twice, survived thrice. So in this case, um, Arga survived once. He survived one incident. Like the Ondina, Arga's ship, the Scotia, was also an oil tanker. In November 1943, it was on its way to Australia. It was in the Indian Ocean when it was attacked by a Japanese submarine. The ship was sunk, but thankfully they managed to get out an SOS before they had to evacuate the ship. So Aga tried to get into a lifeboat, but unfortunately it was already full. It had the captain and other members of the crew. So he was ordered to go to one of the other lifeboats. So he swam away from it, and this pretty much saved his life because soon after the Japanese submarine returned, they captured the captain and took him on board the submarine and then they opened fire on that lifeboat that Arga had initially gone to. Only one man survived. He had thrown himself overboard and the ship's dog. They were the only two survivors of that lifeboat outside of the captain who was taken prisoner. Meanwhile, Arga had managed to find a place in one of the two other lifeboats. Thankfully, they were a bit further away from the submarine and it was dark, it was night, and they managed to very quietly move their lifeboats away from the submarine and they were hidden by what was left of the Scotia. Uh, only part of it had sunk by this point. They stayed there in the dark, hidden, uh, until the submarine left 
So the people in the two lifeboats, they'd actually tied the two lifeboats together so that they wouldn't lose contact with each other. Two days after they had the ship had sunk, the Scotia had sunk, they were rescued. They had been spotted by Catalinas flying over that had received their distress call. And then the HMS Okapi uh, was sent to rescue them. The man who jumped from the captain's lifeboat into the water managed to clamber back on board when the submarine left. He spent three days with the ship's dog before they too were rescued. Like curator Shane Casey, Diane is also full of praise for the brave work of the merchant seamen. The work of the the Merchant Navy during the Second World War was essential to the running of the war. They brought supplies, they brought oil for, for other ships, they just did an amazing amount of work and it wasn't safe. Sometimes they were escorted, sometimes they weren't. Uh, In this case, the Scotia wasn't escorted. And there were genuine dangers from uh, submarines, Japanese submarines, and from uh, Japanese raiders. Did Aga survive the war? Aga survived the war. Um, He went on to work on other ships and thankfully never was sunk again. After the war, he immigrated to Australia, which is part of the reason we have these medals. It's one of the fantastic things about the Merchant Navy. It was such an international story. You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. Our third tale starts with a piece of flotsam. This is um, not just any piece of wood. This is really, really special, a really exciting artefact. I'm back with curator Shane Casey, who's recently uncovered the full story behind this piece of wood in the gallery's collection. It's two planks of wood, shaped, with nails on the end, and it's painted white, and there's black writing on it. This is the what we call the transom of a, a boat. The transom are the pieces of timber right at the, at the stern, or the, the end of the boat, that the rudder attaches to. The timber came from a dinghy that was carried on board a US steamer called the City of Rayville. The cargo ship had plied the waters of the Pacific Ocean for 20 years. On this particular occasion, we're talking 8th of November 1940, so it was a year before the Americans entered the Second World War, and the city of Ravel has just taken a load of lead ingots from Port Piri, and it's going back to America. And unfortunately, off Cape Otway, down in Victoria, the city of Ravel hit a mine, a sea mine. The sea mine had been laid by a German raider, raiding ship. So German ships had laid mines along some sections of the Australian coast? Yeah, it's, it's a little known fact that during the First and Second World Wars, the, uh, the Germans were actually quite active in our waters and had some really notable ships. Of course, the most famous one would be the Cormoran that sank the Sydney. But uh, there, there were some really celebrated instances of uh, these, these German raiders, which were often converted merchant ships that still looked like merchant ships, but they had camouflage that hid their guns. They often had foreign flags that they would fly and they would paint the funnels in different colours and things so that you wouldn't know that it was a German ship until it was too late. But in this particular case, the day before the city of Ravel was hit, uh, another ship, the SS Cumberland, also hit a mine roughly in the same area and went down. So this was the second ship sunk by mines uh, during the Second World War off the waters of Australia. So what happened to the city of Ravel when it struck the mine? A a sea mine has quite a bit of explosive in it and and more than enough to sink a a ship. In this particular case, the foremast was completely blown out of the ship and lead ingots apparently were just hurled you know, to a great height and were raining everywhere, the ship itself started to go down very, very quickly. Now, all of the crew got out and got into lifeboats, but one man, unfortunately, decided to go back into the ship to get his personal possessions, and he unfortunately drowned when the ship went down unexpectedly. Over in Cape Otway, the lighthouse keeper had spotted the explosion and had seen the the smoke and whatnot, He managed to raise the alarm and local fishermen at Oyster Point then put to sea and got out there as quickly as they could and rescued all the people. Meanwhile, 
the authorities had also been notified, including the Navy, who were obviously very worried about the, the possibility of more German mines. And, and this set in train a reaction in the naval circles in Australia to then do really concerted mine-sweeping operations. But meanwhile, anyway, a ship, HMAS Swan, was nearby and made for the scene of the sinking. And it arrived two days later, on the 11th of November, and there was just debris in the water by this stage. But one of the pieces of debris was a, an 18-foot-long ship's dinghy. And the Swan raised the dinghy up onto the deck of the Swan. And uh, we don't know how long they had it there for, maybe a couple of days. But, but basically they decided, oh, it's too big, it's too cumbersome, we don't really need this. And so they broke it apart. And in the record of proceedings of HMAS Swan, there's a mention of this particular incident and how they decided then to save some parts as souvenirs. And what we've got is one of those souvenirs. And the other thing about this piece of timber, it's got City of Rayville, Tampa, Florida painted on it, but over the whole surface of the wood, members of HMAS Swan have written their names and their occupations on, the, on board the ship sometimes. So we've got, for example, H.W. O'Neill, and he's just written Swan underneath. And J.W. Dawson, HMA is Swan. Here's a Stoker Petty Officer, and I can't read his name now, but... No, some of the, <laughs> some of the signatures are hard to read. I've tried to read some yeah. of them too. But how remarkable that they all felt the need to put their names to this yeah. piece of wood. It's, it's almost an age-old thing, isn't it, that we, we sign our signatures on things, have a compulsion to sign things. But luckily, this has saved about... Oh, over 50 signatures from HMA Swan's crew, which we've transcribed now, or many of them. Some of them are illeg- illegible, but uh, it be, would be intriguing to see if some of those uh, members of Swan's crew are still alive. But certainly they'll have relatives. But there's even more historical significance to this signed artefact. Well, amazingly, that it's the first American ship to be sunk by enemy action during the Second World War. And also, unfortunately, the first American death from enemy action in the Second World War. And um, I can't think of any other fragment of the city of Rayville that exists anywhere in the world. So this is a really, really significant piece of um, timber, I think, in, in the collection. And it really harks then, a year later, to the uh, tremendous friendship that we uh, had with the Americans and, and the support that they gave us during the rest of the Second World War. Finally, to Margaret Gordon, an Australian woman who was honoured for her, quote, exceptional qualities of fortitude and endurance. In 1936, en route to England for the coronation of Edward VIII, Margaret met and the following year married Crawford Gordon. He was a Scottish engineer based in India. Curator Diane Rutherford takes up the story. They had been in Rangoon and Crawford got dengue fever and Margaret later caught it as well. She recovered quite well but he didn't and it was recommended that he leave India and go back to the UK. In November 1942, they left Bombay on the British ship, the SSS City of Cairo. Less than a week later, while crossing the South Atlantic at night, the ship was torpedoed by a German U-boat and started sinking. Margaret managed to get on one of the lifeboats, but it tipped over. Gordon went back up onto the ship. Unfortunately, he later dies uh, in a lifeboat, which is taken down by the ship as it sinks. But Margaret ended up on one of the lifeboats. In the end, uh, she ended up on lifeboat four, which had uh, uh, 17 people all up, including her. The memorial holds several items relating to Margaret's story. There's the British Empire Medal she was awarded for her gallantry and the photo of her receiving it, dressed in a trim white naval uniform. There's also a small pair of blunt-nosed, tarnished scissors. They were part of the boat's first aid kit. One of the things that she did while on the boat, while they were trying to reach St Helena, um, a little island very far away from where they sank, she would make with pieces of canvas from the, the sail cover, she made hats and she made moccasins 
She did all sorts of things to try and improve morale and make things as comfortable as possible. It's likely that she used those scissors in order to make those items. Tell us more about what it was like on the lifeboat. Were they sailing in convoy with the other lifeboats? Initially they were sailing in convoy, but they found it very difficult to all stay together. Only one of the lifeboats of the six uh, that um, made it away from the ship had a sextant. So a lot of the lifeboats were relying on watches and compasses if they had them. At night it became very hard to all stick together. Sometimes they would tie themselves together, but in the end each boat sort of to some degree went off in its own way. Four of the lifeboats from the ship were actually rescued, were found and rescued on the 19th of November, so 13 days after the ship sank. Unfortunately, Margaret's lifeboat was one of two that weren't found until December. Supplies on the boat were scarce and conditions soon became grim. They had two kegs and two tanks of water. They had a tin of biscuits, so dry biscuits like hardtack or sea biscuits. They had some chocolate, some Horlicks milk tablets. They, they had rations to last them for a limited period, not for as long as they were on, on the ocean for. Within two weeks of the sinking, the first passenger on the lifeboat died and he was a Lascar or an Indian sailor and within a week the rest of the Lascar um, crew had died. Uh, there were 10 Lascars on board. That left Margaret and six men, European men, and they continued to go on trying to find St Helena but eventually they realised it was a tiny island in the middle of an ocean. Their chances of finding it were slim. They'd become separated from the other lifeboats, didn't know which way to go. So in the end, they had to make a decision and they decided that they would actually try to reach the coast of, of South America. The man in charge of Lifeboat 4 was the city of Cairo's third officer, James Knocker White. He navigated using his watch and the stars. He knew it was a very big job, a very big ask, but they had very little choice in the end. As the journey went on, um, more and more of the survivors died. Some of delirium, some of them started drinking seawater. And in the end, about a week before they were rescued, the last man died. And there was only two survivors left, and that was Knocker White and Margaret Gordon. How were they rescued? It was actually the 27th of December. That morning they received their first rain for the entire time that they were there. They, they never quite made it to rain, so they were able to fill up their water tanks. But then later that morning they saw a convoy, and so they let off their flares. Most of them didn't work. It was literally the last flare they had. They dropped it into the ocean and it set off a smoke signal. A Brazilian uh, minesweeper came and found them and rescued them and brought them on board and the first thing they got to have was a large cup of coffee. Margaret and Knocker White had been on the lifeboat for 52 days. They had got to within 130 kilometres of the Brazilian coast. After some time recuperating, Margaret went to New York where she had an aunt and then spent two years in Washington and London before returning to Australia after the war. Knocker had flown to Miami a month after being rescued, then boarded a ship for the journey home to England. Unfortunately, uh, in March 1943, that ship vanished without trace. It was later discovered it had been sunk by a, a, a U-boat, all hands lost. That's just unbelievably tragic. It's very tragic and... Yeah, I, I think Margaret may have even still been in Brazil at the time that um, Knocker was sailing for um, England and his family were home and, and knew he had survived the sinking of the city of Cairo. Um, so it was a great tragedy for them. But for her to have the only other survivor be lost that way would have really been quite distressing. Did Margaret later talk about her ordeal in detail? Initially, not really. I think a lot of people that knew her didn't know her story unless it was family. In the 1980s, a book was written about the sinking of the city of Cairo and she was eventually tracked down by the author and then she spoke about her experiences. She did write up an account while she was in America that she sent to her mother and we have a, a typed copy of that in our collection. How did she cope with what she'd been through? From what I've heard of her and from what I've read, I think she was a very strong woman and that she just went on and did things. When she was in America, she joined the Women's Royal Naval Service. She also worked as a librarian um, in the Australian Embassy. So she kept herself busy. Um, she did useful things. She helped with the war effort. A remarkable woman. A very remarkable woman. And we're so privileged to have these few items associated with such a, a, an astonishing story.
Thanks for listening to this episode of Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. You can subscribe to the series by going to the Memorial's website or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Thank you.